Uh, what would you say to a physician who's never worked with a PA about what value a PA can add to their practice or to a department? So typically the first thing I will tell them is that a good PA should not cost a physician practice money. Um, in revenue generated, in time savings, in cost um, or in quality of care, those are things that over time build up to the point where their salary, their benefits, everything else that it costs to have a PA on service then is negated. So there is a bit of a learning curve, and if you're hiring, if you're a physician who's never had one before, there's a little bit of a utilization, trying to figure out what you can do. But you know, there's a lot of stuff out there for people to help being able to include and incorporate a PA into your practice in order to be have it be as cost effective as possible. So that's usually what I tell them first and foremost. If you're really looking for it, you know, we're not there to take call for you or for you to be, you know, uh, covering your practice while you go on vacation for, for two weeks. I mean, if that's what you're going to pay for, then that's fine. We can do that. But if you want us to really be incorporated into the practice, you want us to be able to bill for things. You want us to be able to see the patients in the hospital. You want us to be able to first assist in the operations. Well, then the billing and the coding need to follow suit. And if you do all of that right, then it's not going to cost anything to the practice to have a PA, but then you get all the benefits of having somebody who knows what you do, has, is an extension of now your practice, who can have their own clinics and see their own patients. And it then follow, it then goes in that direction. So if they've never had one before, that's usually what I tell them, is that if you really look into it and you really apply it, they really should not cost you any money, and the rest of it's all just icing on the cake. So is it similar to working with a medical resident, if that were a... Uh... I guess, a, a, a way of comparing to something that they might be familiar with or yeah, not quite? Kind, kind of. I mean, when you have residents, the, they, they rotate through. So there's a little bit of a person getting to know the person before you can really be um, entrusted with uh, or they're entrusted uh, to be able to do the things that you want them to do. So, yes, that initial part is, is just feeling out the personalities, make sure they fit. Um, but after that, you know, it really can just be as much as the physician would like. There, obviously, for procedural type stuff, there is some oversight. But at some point, it just gets to the point where the your physician looks at you and says, "Ah, oh, you're fine. Yeah, you can go ahead and go do that central line." And then that is something that maybe you get to when you're a chief resident. But when you have a constant cycle of residents coming through, you have a constant varying level of abilities. Whereas the PA, once you train them and you get them to where you want them to be that's where they're going to be for the entire part of the practice. So it's a little bit of work up front. It is very similar to a, a, a resident, but that slowly absolves over time. Yeah, and especially when you've got a PA that's been working with you for years. Mm -hmm. It's almost like duplicating yourself. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so I just wanted to go back to the reimbursement piece. So I know that PAs in uh, the United States are able to independently bill mm -hmm. insurance companies. So in Canada, that's not the case. Um, our reimbursement model uh, doesn't really exist, and that's something that we are working on, right. uh, working on improving. So that's a challenge that we're hoping yeah, to, yeah. to overcome. Um, so uh, the way that jobs are advertised in the U.S., I find, well, especially in primary care and for some specific specialties, they will say, you know, looking for a PA or NP as if the two are almost mm -hmm. interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the case with regards to scope of practice, or is this just a perception that I have? Uh, no, on? I mean, a, a lot of jobs are, are advertised for that to the point where a lot of these large corporations um, actually have a collective term, the, you know, advanced practice providers or APPs or APCs, advanced practice clinicians, and they do that just so that Basically, yes, the scope of practice and what they can do is very, very similar. Um, the big difference between PAs and MPs is that MPs are, are, are independent practitioners. They, don't need to, they do not need to have a collaborating physician on their license where PAs do, and that's a lot of the, a lot of the debate at the national level with the PA profession now is you know, the OTP, optimal team practice. Do we want to try to um, push this autonomous practice? And again, that's a that's a, a whole nother debate and a whole nother episode probably, but uh, for the most part, yes. I and 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 oftentimes patients know what a, a nurse practitioner is before they know what a PA is. So I use that analogy a lot. They say, "Oh, well, what's a PA?" I said, "Well, have you heard of a nurse practitioner?" "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that my you know family provider is a nurse practitioner." "Oh, okay, we're very similar, very similar." And then I don't go any deeper than that. Um, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's not really the best, but if 
I can explain what I do in an easier way, then I'll then I'll use that.